Michigan makes a statement in Madison next on this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. But there's going to be one team that's going to play solely as a team. No man is more important than the team. No coach is more important than the team. The team, the team, the team. Looks deep for Anthony Clark. Waits for it. Yep, Clark. This is no time for that. In the pocket and a sack. Tim Jamison. Brady gets terrific. Throws it and a touchdown night again. Schultz just before Brazil got it. And a leaping interception by Woodson. Harbaugh back to throw over the middle. Caught by Kohler at the five on his feet. Touchdown, Michigan. On its way. It's good. He's 5'7", 179 pounds, a junior at Michigan. But Jamie Morris packs a wallop, and he delivers for Bo Schimbeck. And here's your first play. Pressure coming. Sack. It is Glenn Steele, number 81, who fought his way through the traffic. Option. And Robinson calls his own number, and he's going to score. Oh, an easy touchdown for Ron Robinson and Michigan. championship again because we're going to play as a team and when we play as a team and the old season is over you and I know it's going to be Michigan again Michigan. Go Blue, I'm Steve Dace. Welcome to this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. And what a fun episode it is because the Wolverines win a game in Madison, Wisconsin every 20 years, whether you like it or not. And it just so happens that we were on the good side of that. And what a weird series this is, by the way. You know, there's all this talk about these two teams every time they're going to face each other and how much of a slobber knocker and rock fight and how physical it'll be. Every year it's like a blowout, man. I mean, 2017, they blew us out. 2018, we blow them out. 2019 and 2020, they blow us out. This year, we blew them out. And this is, regardless of what you think Wisconsin is, uh, it is maybe the best defense Michigan has on its entire schedule. This is one of the toughest places to play in all of the Big Ten, maybe all of the country. And it is one of the bigger wins of the Jim Harbaugh era. And uh, there's a million things I want to say about this game, but then that would be a very long podcast. So let me start with three big takeaways I had in the wake of Michigan's big win, 38-17, to last Saturday. First and foremost, let me say, I think we saw the team and culture. Little things like the players jumping around during jump around and then going down into the the Wisconsin student section to do it with them. I've never seen an opponent do that against Wisconsin before. Just little signs like that, that we are, I think, finally seeing the team and culture we thought we were getting when we hired Harbaugh. And I think it's the first time we've seen it maybe since the 2018 revenge tour. And it's not just that Michigan won, but how. Michigan was aggressive in both scheme and coaching. How often have we said that? Michigan was violent, knocking Wisconsin's two best offensive players out of the game. And Michigan did whatever it took to win. Took a flea flicker, took going for it on fourth down in your own territory, uh, took pooch kicks. It took things that they tried that didn't work. It took putting J.J. McCarthy in to to run uh, the, the read option. They tried everything. They didn't go in there with some dogmatic view of the game's got to look like this, otherwise we don't want to win. No, they went in there with whatever it takes, man, whatever it takes. Like Captain America and Iron Man in Endgame, whatever it takes. And I think we thought we were getting that, whatever it takes, coach in Jim Harbaugh. We saw it the first two years. The last few years, even years when they've been good, it was kind of whatever it takes, provided it's what we feel comfortable doing. Saturday, we saw Michigan literally do Whatever it 
takes, that sort of merciless side of Jim Harbaugh we saw a lot at Stanford. We lot we saw a lot in the NFL that we frankly haven't seen a lot here at Michigan. And it was a welcome sight to see it on Saturday against the Badgers. And something else to note, if you look at every surprisingly great Michigan football season of my fandom, which goes back to 1983, I'm not talking about teams that won championships. Some of these teams didn't, but they still had great seasons. Every one of those seasons had a shockingly dominant road win early on that set the stage for that 1985 team that Jimmy was on, the win at Michigan State, the Wisconsin win in 1988, uh, the Michigan State win for that 1997 national championship team that went over number two Notre Dame back in 2006. Six, every surprisingly great Michigan football season. And remember the stat I gave you at the start of the year, the previous nine times Michigan went unranked in the AP poll, in the preseason AP poll, five of them, Michigan finished 12th or higher. All right. And so um, there's always that surprisingly dominant early road win. And for Michigan, this was it. The Wolverines were actually an underdog. In fact, this is the first time uh, Harbaugh had been 0-12 as an underdog. This is the first time he has won a game at Michigan as the underdog. And then finally, I think you've got these three big takeaways. I think you saw Michigan took a punch and finally punched back. When Michigan tried the pooch kick there, and I know a lot of people didn't like it because it didn't work, I'm not criticizing coaches when they try to be aggressive because very seldom do they try it, especially ours. So I, I like the aggression, and it did almost work. I mean, Wisconsin muffed that uh, pooch kit. They, they just happened to get on top of the football and beat us to it. But when they came down and scored that touchdown before half, I think I thought – I mean, I said it was over. I think a lot of you thought that because we've seen this play out before. Michigan has to be a front-running team. They don't take punches and punch back well. We saw them do that in Madison. So that's a good sign. I love the way that we incorporated J.J. McCarthy into the running game to really stress defenses. And I think the fact that you saw Cade McNamara play his best half, I think, of the entire season in the second half against Wisconsin in response to that shows that he didn't sulk, he didn't pout because J.J. McCarthy got in there and McCarthy got the the, the game winning touchdown run on the sneak by the way there was one hell of a bush push by Hassan Haskins and Mike Sandra still they pushed J.J. McCarthy five full yards into the end zone um, and he didn't sulk you know when J.J. McCarthy threw one of the prettiest touchdown passes you'll ever see uh, that 50 yarder down the seat down the sideline to Dalen Baldwin you saw him respond with his best half of the season I believe And so I think that also speaks well to the chemistry on this team, too. So that's a good sign. And then the third thing uh, to note about that as well is just overall aggression and innovation was everywhere. Aggression and innovation we have long wanted to see. Innovation at Michigan the last few years has been, all right, Shea Patterson will keep it on the zone read this time. Or Jabril Peppers will come in and never throw, but just do a, you know, run the end run on the uh-uh, wildcat over and over and over again. That, that's, that's, or Eddie McDoom will just come in for the jet sweep. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's been a lot of the innovation we've seen around here the last uh, several years. Michigan was both aggressive and innovative. And I think when you honor the game like that, it honors you back. And Michigan, and it paid off for a massive win for the Wolverines. Now, if they come out of Lincoln, Nebraska, with a win. I don't believe Michigan's won a game there since like 1905 or something, but this is only the second time they played there since, I think. Um, if Michigan comes out of Lincoln, Nebraska with a win on Saturday, and then you go into the bye, I think at that point, halfway through the year, the Wolverines will be firmly ensconced in the AP Top 10. They're on the fringes of it now. And at that point, you start thinking, all right, this is a legitimate Big Ten title contender. But at least we know this. Michigan is at least back to being where it was pre-COVID, which is pretty good. Maybe not great, maybe not elite, maybe not championship good, but pretty good. It's at least back to that. What is the ceiling of this team? The floor has certainly raised since the season began. Where's the ceiling at, though? That's what we're going to find out beginning this Saturday night in Lincoln. We'll come back, find out what our good friend Mark Rogers thinks about it from the scarlet and gray side of the septic tank. But first, let me tell you about our friends over at DraftKings. Another week 
of the NFL season means another shot to win big at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. New customers can bet just $1 on any NFL game and win 100 bucks in free bets if either team just scores a point. You can't beat that. The last 0-0 tie in the NFL was like 1943, so I, I think you're in pretty good shape with that one. You can also play what I like to do. That Those are same game parlays. Combine multiple bets from the same game for a bigger payout. So if you think, hey, I like like one side and I like the total in this game that gives you even more legs for better odds to win. So download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use the promo code Michigan Podcast. Bet just $1 on any NFL game and you can win 100 bucks in free bets if either team scores just 1 point. That's promo code Michigan Podcast this week at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. And remember, if you or someone you know has a gambling problem and wants help, call the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services Gambling Disorder Helpline at 800 270 7117. 21 and only, 21 and over, Michigan only. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for full terms and conditions. And now the view from the other side, from perhaps the one and only reasonable bucknut, at least that we know, our good friend Mark Rogers himself has a fantastic college football channel covering the entire sport right here on YouTube. Mark Rogers, the voice of college football. Good to see you again, my friend. How are you? Good to see you, Steve. I am loving this Big Ten race. It should be intriguing. Indeed. We've got the first game between top five teams in the Big Ten that does not include Michigan or Ohio State since 1962. This is the first time Iowa has played in a game between two top five teams since their number one versus number two game against Michigan in 1985. So, um, and, and James Franklin, by the way, has the same awful record on the road against ranked teams Jim Harbaugh does. But just for some odd reason, no one ever mentions it or talks about it, probably because he beat Ohio State once. And so, therefore, he has a papal dispensation against all the criticism that Jimmy gets. But that notwithstanding, that should be a fun game this weekend. But let, let's get to your thoughts on the where the Wolverines are. I laid out a few things uh, at the top of the show. The aggression, the innovation, these are sorts of things that many a Michigan message board, many a Michigan blog, many a Michigan podcast and radio show for many, many moons now have kvetched about. And suddenly the Wolverines just decided to lay it all out there uh, with all kinds of aggression and innovation. Uh, As a result, they got their first win in Madison. Uh, in 20 years, one of the more impressive wins of the of the Harbaugh era probably knocked Wisconsin out. And you had to know the Badgers went into that game kind of really desperate, knowing they couldn't afford a loss. So your impressions now of, of I, we both agreed after the non-conference that Michigan's floor was raised. Right. We both agreed on that. OK, so now I think we're having a conversation about what's the ceiling. I still want to see Saturday night in Lincoln, Nebraska because I still don't fully trust my team wearing white uniforms quite yet. And I might be more willing to have that ceiling conversation next week heading into that bye. But where are you at? I'm at a different place than a lot of college football fans that respond to my channel, at least, who aren't impressed by many wins in the country. And then I point out to them statistically that there are very few wins against the type teams that most people are impressed by. So despite the one and three record, despite the struggling offense, that includes surprisingly the offensive line for Wisconsin is really bad right now. And Graham Mertz obviously having his ups and downs, although he gave us that brief glimpse of greatness at the end of the first half where he made two remarkable throws that I had a checklist of items that I was looking at this Michigan football team. And most of those were checked off. So first and foremost, Can Michigan run the football after what we saw in the second half against Rutgers? Can they do it against a quality, quality defense? Well, yes and no. They weren't stopped stone cold by this Wisconsin defense like the Badgers did to Penn State, like the Badgers did against Notre Dame. They ran it fairly effectively. Of course, didn't have anywhere near the success that they've had the rest of the season. But this Wisconsin defense is still a top-notch unit. So they ran it effectively enough. But when they couldn't run the ball, yes, they turned to the passing game. They turned to the passing game for explosive dynamic plays. And that was an effective performance by Kate McNamara. And, oh, yeah, that first uh, 
series of the second half given to J.J. McCarthy. He explodes with a 56-yard touchdown pass. So when you throw for 260 yards and three touchdowns with no turnovers out of the passing game, that's an effective performance. You mentioned the road woes of this program under Jim Harbaugh. And even with Wisconsin struggling, that's a difficult place to play against a top-notch defense. And they didn't come out just with a win. It was a decisive second-half performance, not a 16-13, you know, right. white knuckler. They were decisive in the second half, and I think that means something. So, Mark, I've got some trusty numbers to kind of back up your assertion because you and I, we both love our data. Uh, if you don't mind me reading these right off my phone here. Total yards gained and given ratio so far this season by opponent for Wisconsin in three Big Ten games, or three, uh, uh, yeah, three uh, Power Five games. Penn State, they were plus 74. Notre Dame, they were plus 70. Against Michigan, they were minus 155. What well, rushing yards gained and given so far against Power Five teams? Penn State, plus 130 on the ground. Notre Dame, plus 69 against Michigan, minus 69. And that's, to me, it's not just that they went up there and won. And, and hey, when we went up there in 2001, you're old enough to remember that game. That was that was fugly, okay? People turnovers, no quarterback was any good, okay? Um, this was not. This was the worst loss I think Wisconsin had had up there since like 2011 or 12. It's not easy to go in there, even if they're kind of down and maybe just a bowl-eligible team, to just absolutely dominate them up front and punk them physically and Michigan did that so that to me it's the manner in which this was done I'd have taken 13 to 12 and said thank you let's get the hell out of here but what has me re contemplating the ceiling of this team is they just went out there and played Wisconsin football with better athletes something Michigan fans have been like why don't we just play the way Wisconsin does but we have better athletes right well they finally did that and look what happened Penn State's a really good football team uh Everybody looks for flaws. Everybody can find flaws with every football team in the nation, excluding two. And so Penn State's included in that. I know that they're not running the ball that effectively against anyone, although I heard that they didn't run the ball effectively against Indiana. I was focused on other games. They ran it for five yards per carry and over 200 yards. So the the numbers that you just laid out is basically a different interpretation of yards per play and yards per play aside from turnovers is the best indicator of who uh, is going to win a game. And it's the best indicator of who dominated the line of scrimmage and who won the game um, at the point of attack. And so that means something Penn state's one of the top five to 10 football teams in America, regardless of ranking right now, I believe that they're going to substantiate that ranking to a certain degree, maybe not number three in the country and Notre Dame again, they have struggled, yes, but they are a top 15 unit on both sides of the ball in the country, and Michigan outplayed Wisconsin decidedly more than those two teams outplayed Wisconsin. So I am comfortable saying this and see if you agree. I don't know how good this team can be, but I, I think we can at least say the program is where it was pre-COVID, a top 15, 16 program in the country. It might still end up nine and three when you look at the game still on the schedule, right? At Michigan State, at Penn State. Um, you know, and then apparently there's a 12th game at the end of the year. I'm not aware of that. But um, when you look at the schedule, it still might end up nine and three. The 2019 team was nine and three, but on SB plus, uh, SP plus, they were like eighth or something in the country because their three losses were Penn State, Alabama, and Ohio State. Okay. So it still might be nine and three. Um, and so, it, 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 but at the very least, I think we can say that that last year has truly been proven to be an aberration. The new culture, the little little things like the the team not just doing the jump around, but then going over to the Wisconsin student section and doing it with them. That's just the kind of stuff buttoned down. Don't show a lot of. You just don't see a lot of that in the Harbaugh era. Frankly, it doesn't a lot of times feel like a college team. It feels like kind of a pro team, you know, kind of Kirk Ferentz, but with better play, better athletes. I, I just, um, I, to me, at the very least, I think we're back to where we were pre-COVID. Is that safe to say? Steve, let's dig up uh, some of our conversations during the offseason. Doesn't that sound like what I was saying? Yeah. So basically, my take on this team was, 
I'm not necessarily going to be lulled into the rhetoric of the, it's a different vibe, a different attitude where we've uh, turned the page and we've hit reset and all of that. I, I didn't discount it. I didn't not believe it. But, of course, we hear that from every team during the summer anyway. But that taken into account, I kept saying this is a six-game under adverse circumstances, and certainly everyone had to endure it as well, but different teams dif responded different ways, that I wasn't necessarily counting that six games uh, against Michigan. They count in the standings, but why is this team, why is this program based on recruiting, based on personnel, any different than what it was 2019 and prior to? And here we are. Final thing, let's talk about the game Saturday night in Lincoln. I don't think Michigan's won over there since like 1905 or something, but they've also only played over there one time uh, since then. Uh, one of the one of the uh, more embarrassing games uh, of the Hoke era, which is saying something, because for whatever reason, our backup quarterback, Devin Gardner, got switched to receiver, wasn't ready. We had to play a kid named Russell Bellamy, and it was just a feel terrible for him. As he, I mean, he's not good, but that's not his fault. All right, the coaches put him. You can't blame a kid for taking a scholarship to Michigan. All right, but they they put him in a position on a Saturday night in front of the country to just embarrass himself. You know, uh, I I don't suspect that'll happen again. But Nebraska is it's Nebraska's analytics are definitely ahead of its record. Uh, they are right now in terms of Vegas point spread power ratings. They're, they've got them like a top twenty five team. That's why you're looking at a spread with the home field advantage of only about a field goal right now. I think the key stat here to look for is I think Michigan will struggle to run again. I think Nebraska's defensive line is good. I don't think the back seven of its defense is that great. And the offensive line at Nebraska is not good and has struggled all year to protect Adrian Martinez, even despite his mobility. So I, I think can Michigan – continue to get that pressure on the quarterback it has since the beginning of the year and now you're seeing that expand beyond Aiden Hutchinson now that we're getting into Big Ten play and Big Ten guy you know there, we, there's film out there of Wisconsin block and Aiden Hutchinson with like three guys all right now you're seeing some other players like David Ojabo Big Ten player of the week get involved can that continue and then can you do that out of a zone look sort of an NFL zone blitz scheme, and we do have an NFL DC, so that you're not in a man coverage where your your DB's backs are turned and Mar Martinez gets flushed out of the pocket and runs for 75 yards, right? You see what I'm saying? So I think that's kind of one of the key nuances of this game. What are your thoughts on how this is going to play out? Well, my first thought is thinking back to that, uh, I believe 23-9, I'm pretty good about scores, 23-9 Michigan loss at Nebraska with Bellamy at quarterback, mm -hmm. and it was similar to Ohio State fans watching Joe Bosserman just prior to the Braxton Miller era at Ohio State and thinking, am I watching an Ohio State football game here with this guy at quarterback? Yeah, I mean, it, it was, was Nick Sheridan level bad, yeah. And you yes. felt bad for the kid because he just should not yeah. have been in that situation, right? Yeah. So in terms of what we're going to see on Saturday night, uh, this Nebraska football team, uh, and, and I hear a lot from Nebraska football fans, we've got a Nebraska channel, we've got a Nebraska show on Tuesday nights. They are giddy. They are giddy about their 56-7 to win. Northwestern's the worst team. I think this confirmed it. Worst team in the Big Ten. So Nebraska finally did what you are supposed to do against the worst team in the conference. They didn't just limp through with a 27-16 to win. They put the hammer down. They annihilated Northwestern. 657 yards of total offense. The, the most impressive offensive performance of uh, Nebraska football during the Big Ten era. But... When are they going to beat a decent, not phenomenal opponent, decent opponent? Uh, we were having this conversation on our Nebraska show last night, and I'm going through the scores during the Scott Frost era. Minnesota, the Minnesota P.J. Fleck first year at 7-6. and six, That is the best team that Nebraska has beaten. Hmm. Will Nebraska compete? Will they play down to the wire, a possibly fourth quarter game? Yeah, they, they keep doing that. Uh, they've done it against Michigan State on the road, against Oklahoma on the road. Yes. Can they play close? Yes. Uh, do they have obvious flaws and also strengths to their team that you pretty much outlined? I'm not impressed with their receivers. I don't think they really scare anyone there. They may have finally found a running back. Uh, but um, I have no doubt. I have little doubt that Nebraska is going to be in the football game in the fourth quarter. 
but can they finally beat somebody decent and make the plays and stop making the mistakes that have been the hallmark of Scott Frost's teams there? Well, that's the key. I mean, Michigan has one turnover this season, and it happened with the the fourth string quarterback in the fourth quarter against Wisconsin, throwing to a spot the receiver didn't go to, and it got picked off against a team that has been very, very prone to beat itself. So we shall see. Mark, good to talk to you as always, brother. Take care, all right? Great talking to you, Steve. Thank you so much. You bet. This week's Twitter poll results, we asked you, what do you now think Michigan's final record will be? 45.1% of you voted 10 and 2. You can see there with the check mark, that was my vote. 26.6% uh, of you voted 9 and 3. 19.1% of you are at 11 and 1. You're where ESPN's FBI is at right now. They have Michigan starting 11 and 0 before the perennial loss to the team that shall not be named in the game that no longer takes place. And then 9.1% of you are still holding firm to that skepticism at 8 and 4. I mean, listen, I, I'm still skeptical. It's just my the floor of my skepticism is a lot higher than it was at the start of the year when I thought eight and four was the ceiling. That brings us to this week's feedback of the week from Ben Anderson, who says, are you ready to say you will actually watch the Ohio state game this year? LOL. No. Two things you have to know about me. Um, public pressure does nothing to me. I, I will. In fact, it, 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 even if I think it's possible, I might've made the wrong call. If you begin to publicly pressure me on it, I'll just stick with it out of spite. <laughs> I mean, that's just how I roll. But number two, it's the exact opposite. The better Michigan appears to be, the more likely it is I will fulfill the vow. Like if we really were going to be like fire Jim Harbaugh bat this year, it's far more likely I give in at the end just because I want to see a definitive verdict like Brady Hoke's last game in 2014, for example, a definitive verdict and turn the page. But if it turns out we're, we might be really good, oh, there's, then I don't want any part of having my scroat ripped out once again by the uh, the team down south. I, I just, no, no. The better Michigan is, the more likely I keep that vow. I, I can't put myself through that again. A man needs to know his limits. I, after 15 years, I have reached mine. If Michigan would like people like me to take the game more seriously, Michigan can start by taking it more seriously and maybe win it at once every 15 years. All right, so, and, and, and that goes to the Kool-Aid question too. I still think the most watched episode in the history of this show was the episode where I chugged the Kool-Aid after the Penn State win in the revenge tour. That's never happening again until they beat Ohio State. And since I don't believe we will ever beat Ohio State again, that's just a long-winded way of me saying I'm never chugging the Kool-Aid ever again. But I would love to be proven wrong, but I'm going to have to be proven wrong. That's going to do it for this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. Back at it again next week after hopefully another big win on the road. Love the blue pants right away. Although, frankly, I'm fine not wearing any pants if you're going to keep winning. You can go out there pantless as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but uh, love the, the blue pant look is a pretty sharp look. But everything looks good when you're winning, right? Uh, we're back at it again next week. Please remember to follow us on Twitter at Michigan Podcast. Keep up to date on what we think. All things maize and blue. And also, like, rate, subscribe, five-star review, share, follow, etc. Whatever the case may be on whichever platform you access us through, like iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, right here on YouTube. Thanks to all of you that do those things to help us reach more and more Michigan fans and rubbernecking Buckeyes like yourself. Uh, we appreciate each and every one of you. Your views all count the same. Until next week, I'm Steve Dace. Go Blue.